what were some of the surprising things that you learned? I mean, things that you weren't ex maybe weren't expecting to learn about these animals. Well, I, and I think that goes back in a way to to your question, which I failed to, yet to answer, which was around, you know, what did I learn from them? And I think there were there were many surprising things and many really wonderful things that that I observed over the almost a decade of watching these big cats day in and day out. And I mean, literally watching them for six, seven hours a day, 24, you know, 24, seven, 365 days a year. Um, and, you know, I, I think I, I started to mention that, that a lot of the behaviors mirrored what I'd seen in the corporate world. And I, you know, one of the, one of the surprising things to me was the amount of change that these big cats face on a daily basis. And again, you know, they face change not just because every single hunt is different and has a whole set of completely different variables, the wind, the, the, the conditions, the weather, the prey they're hunting, the topography, the landscape, you know, so there's so many different factors that, that any one of these super predators has to take into account when it goes into, into a hunt situation. But, you know, just, just generally, the, the, the extent of the competition was a, was a complete unknown. And every single day that changed because, you know, a leopard hunting in the presence of a lion has to, has to take its prey up a tree to protect it from the lion's, you know, parasiting, stealing that, that, yeah. that kill. And so uh, there, there's just change all the time in an ecosystem. And so that was a surprising and, and interesting thing for me to learn. And then with that was obviously to look at the ways that the big cats handle that change. Uh, the, the, the extent to which the leopard is so incredibly adaptable and can hunt a variety of different prey and which allows it to hunt according to the availability of whatever prey is right there in it, in its, um, within its reach. And, um, you know, so leopards hunt anything from, you know, a large portion of their, their prey does tend to be large mammals. So antelope the size of impala, maybe a little bit smaller, but a large, and, and, and a, this was also surprising to me, was to, to learn that leopards don't just hunt impala. And actually, impala constitute about roughly 58% of leopards' diet. But the rest of leopards' diet is often made up of very small meals. Um, eaten at more regular intervals. They might prey on, on much smaller mammals, mongoose, um, uh, warthogs, uh, aardvarks, um, birds, yeah. reptiles. You know, I, I've, seen, I've seen leopard take a catfish out of the Sabi River. So they're extremely adaptable and that makes them very resilient in the face of change. Um, a, lot of, lot of, lot of snacking, a lot of snacking between big meals. <laughs> correct, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, the big meals are not that easy to come by. And so that, that snacking actually forms a very important part of their diet. Lions, the way that lions handle change is through their incredible teamwork and their nimbleness as a team in the face of change. You know, um, some examples of that are um, ways in which they, the relationships between the individuals in the team are so strong, John. They are they are really, really everything when it comes to lions hunting. It's not just about the strategy. They're, they're constantly reinforcing those relationships with displays of what we would call affection. They're very physical with one another. And that, those displays actually have a, a physiological function because in, when they rub up against each other, when they lie on top of each other, when they're jumping on each other, playing with each other, it's reinforcing the social bond. But it's actually that in that process, they're they're sharing pheromones, they're actually um, sharing scent, and it helps them to, uh, to identify their, their fellow pride mate from, from other lines that might be foreign, foreign to them. And right. so those relationships are very strong. The, the extent to which in a lion pride, you never hear what I heard in the corporate world a lot. It's not my job. You don't hear right. that in a lion pride. In a lion pride, every single member of that team has a, regardless of what role they play, every single member of that team is critical to the team. Every single member of the team can put, can wear multiple hats. Every single member of a lion pride can detect prey, they can stalk prey, they can chase prey, 
they can run incredibly fast, and they can kill prey. And mm -hmm. sometimes one member of the lion pride might be called upon to do the kill, sometimes another. And so they each have to be able to adapt to whatever role is required to be filled right at that time. And, and um, it was incredible for me to, to see that play out um, over years of watching lions hunt. Yeah, and it's really interesting, um, Lauren, because thinking about that in the context of today and, uh, you know, the crisis that the world is in and all of that and businesses are in trying to, I mean, th th those key points about uh, adaptability, right? So you need to be adaptable and to be able to react, understand and react, react to your surroundings. You need incredible teamwork. And then you need flexibility within the team to be able to move things. These things that are often like companies struggle with, because as you said, you know, not my job or people love like lines of demarcation, right? You know, that I do this and you do that. And uh, the idea of being, of being flexible and people doing different things or filling in here or adapting to things. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes people struggle with, but it's a great it's a great lesson that you just outlined there because these animals are living with unpredictability and and imminent crisis almost every day right i mean if you had a drought i mean and they have no control over that it's it's a crisis right absolutely and um you know it 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 was incredible if not surprising for me to to watch the ways in which they dealt with crisis situations and and they have you know, the big cats have crises every day, um, crises like, as you say, drought. Um, another, another thing they have to deal with is migratory prey. So, you know, the, the big cats I mentioned are very territorial. They stay in one general home range, but their prey is free to move out of that home range. There's nothing stopping their prey from moving. And the best example of that is, of course, the great migration in East Africa, which I've had the privilege to be guiding for the last 29 years. I've been guiding pretty much right. every year safaris to see the great migration, which, and it's just, it's unbelievable. It's a, it's, it's a spectacle, you know, that, that, that is so difficult to describe. But one of the great things that I've observed over those nearly three decades of guiding in, in um, guiding safaris to see the great migration is the ways in which those predators adapt to those the, the the moving herds of wildebeest and zebra, and um, you know those those wildebeest and zebra, and it's actually to be honest there there are some gazelles that migrate as well, but it's primarily wildebeest and zebra that move over tens of thousands of kilometers in a in a 365 um, day year. Um, that migration moves big big distances, and when the migration moves out of the area, those predators can't just follow it because if they do, they're wandering into the territory of competing predators. So what they do is they have to adapt and they have to change the species that they hunt. And so they'll, they'll for that, that kind of feast versus famine, the, the feast period when the wildebeest are in their territory, they capitalize, boy, they're, they're hunting those wildebeest big time. But the moment the wildebeest move out, they've got to change their plan. They've got to change their MO. And so they start hunting more resident species. In the case of lions, they're hunting buffalo that won't move those big distances. They might hunt warthog. They might hunt some of the resident gazelles. You know, so it's it's um, incredible to see the the way in which they adapt very quickly to to those new conditions. I, I actually wrote John um, kind of at the beginning of the pandemic when when we certainly in South Africa were in lockdown and many other countries were in total lockdown. Um, I wrote an article around crisis, which I called "Necessity is the Mother of Reinvention," and you know, in that in that article, uh, I I share some of the ways in which the animals and the big cats in particular reinvent themselves, and they have to do that sometimes on a daily basis. And I think, especially in this time that we find ourselves now of COVID, um, many countries still in in lockdown many countries in turmoil, many economies in turmoil, many industries, you know, completely trashed, actually. Yeah. In, in this yeah. time of crisis that we find ourselves in, taking those lessons of adaptability, of flexibility, of, of reinventing ourselves, 
taking those lessons from the animals and the big cats, uh, I think can really, you know, might really be able to help help folks. Yeah, no, I totally agree because if you if you think if you think about it, uh, if you're in a, if you're in an industry right now, or your typical target buyer, for instance, is is in a sector that's maybe I mean, like if maybe the airline industry is a great example, right? Maybe if you sell into the airline industry now, maybe you have to pivot a little. Like if you sell to commercial airlines, maybe you need to start looking at the private the private airline industry because that's doing well when the you know the major commercials are not. But to your point um, about that flexibility, rather than just you know if the big cats if they're if they're primary prey left and they said oh well nothing I can do, the prey's left, right? You know, they've starved to death. So they have to figure out a way to, to adapt. And I think that is a fantastic lesson out of this. Yeah, and you know, and, and I think the idea of it being life and death creates an urgency in, in the big cats, certainly that, that actually forces them many times out of their comfort zone. You know, when lions are hunting buffalo, buffalo are, are very, very dangerous they're massive they're tough and it's a massive risk for lions to hunt buffalo many lions get killed in the process of hunting buffalo and and that necessity takes them out of their comfort zone and actually forces them to elevate their performance which is the way to get exceptional results you know and and i think that's a very powerful lesson um in a crisis crisis time especially is that we need to be willing to get out of our comfort zone because that is what is going to take us to the next level. And it really is, it really is adapt or die. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's one or the other. Yeah, no, no, fantastic. So um, just before we end, what, what is one last piece of advice maybe that you would give to people who maybe, you know, feel stuck or powerless in their current situation um, as somebody who's gone through these major life transitions that you did, um, what advice would you give to people who feel stuck and powerless? I would say, John, don't be scared of the road less traveled. It, it, it can be scary. It can be daunting, especially in this time where it's, it's difficult for people. But my, my advice would really be, if you have a dream, follow the dream. Because, I, and I read a wonderful quote um, and I might butcher it, so I apologize if I do, but I, I think it was by a fellow Howard Thurman, if I remember correctly, and it was something like, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go and do that, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. It's something like that, and mm -hmm. it's a wonderful quote, and I think it really, you know, it, 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 um, it can really hopefully help people to understand that, that there's not, there's not, it, it becomes unsustainable to do what you think the world wants you to do. Do what you want to do, because that's what the world really, really needs. And so, you know, that might involve taking the road less traveled. It might involve um, some adversity, you know, where there, there will be adversity, that, that's a given. And, um, you know, and don't listen to the naysayers. I had plenty naysayers telling me, why are you giving up architecture? Why are you giving up a stable career as a management consultant? You're going to the bush. What are you doing? You'll never succeed. You know, don't listen to them because, you know, for me, for me, that the dream was so powerful that it, it, I, I didn't need to be convinced to do that. I knew I had to do it. It was almost like I had no choice. And when your dream is, is so strong, it, um, it will get you through any adversity. It will get you through any obstacles. And if, you know, if, if one is willing to do some hard work, because what I also learned, you know, I, I wasn't the most inherently talented game ranger. I, I knew nothing. Like I said, I didn't, you know, that we were required to learn all these Latin names. The only Latin names I knew were, were you know, Spaghetti and Tagliatelle and, and a couple of architects uh, who Michelangelo, you know, and Leonardo right. da Vinci. That was the extent of my, my Latin. So, you know, where, where there's a will, I really do believe there's a way. You can overcome those obstacles if, you, if your dream is strong enough. And it really all starts yeah. with, you know, the dream. Yeah, listen, that's fantastic, Lauren. I think great advice for people. And 
fascinating, fascinating story and so many great lessons to be learned, not just from your own personal, your own personal journey, but from, as you said, from the animals that you had the privilege to, to live and work with. Uh, so all of Lauren's information, the bigcatguy.com will be, or bigcatguy.com, all of uh, Lauren's information will be below this video. But before we go, just briefly, Lauren, if you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself, what you do. Sure, thanks, John. Yeah, um, you know, I hate talking about myself. I'd much rather talk about the animals, to be honest. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, uh, so John mentioned my website, bigcatguy.com. I've had the good fortune to to be invited to speak around the world over the last sort of 10 to 15 years and, and met some wonderful people. And I, I love what I do. I, I love sharing the information and knowledge with, with folks around the world in different settings. I've been fortunate to talk to athletes and high level executives and, and middle management and folks on the factory floor. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I love, talking to them and sharing the message. And I've, I've been fortunate also that I've chosen a message that I find really kind of lands really nicely with people. It's, um, I'm, not, um, I'm not your regular motivational speaker. I don't get up on the chair and tell you to go rah, rah. Um, I just tell some stories and, and share some lessons. And, and I find that people kind of enjoy that and they, they're able to take that home and it kind of sticks with them. And, and um, I, I been very blessed and fortunate to to have had uh, that background you know and and been able to kind of marry my my love for sharing with people with my love for the bush and um and i i, I wish that for everybody that they can find that for themselves because that's when they will truly be you know their best and realize their potential Fantastic. Um, again, Lauren, this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another expert inside interview really soon. Thank you.